Zoom. Zoom, Zoom. All right, start seeing some people rolling in. Thank you so much for coming tonight. We appreciate it. Hi, everybody. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Pat. It's good to see you, Pat. I wish I could actually see you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening, I should say. It's dark outside. Hello. Welcome, welcome. Thank you all for joining. Hi, Judy. Good to see you. Good to see your name, I should say. <laughs> Hi, everybody. We're going to give it about one more minute, and then we will get started. Let some people roll in. I hope everybody is having a great evening, had a great dinner, ready to learn some stuff. <laughs> it's going to be a good night. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Okay. All right. Give it a couple more minutes. I'm sorry, seconds, I should say. All right, seven o'clock. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Treatment Resistant Neuropsychiatric Psych Illness Extent Causes Evaluation and Treatment. Brought to you by NAMI, Cook County North Suburban, and Dr. Stephen Best, the Director of Neuroscience Center in Deerfield, Illinois. I am Bree Hookstra, the Program Director at NAMI, Cook County North Suburban. NAMI, or the National Alliance on Mental Illness, is the nation's largest grassroots mental health organization, providing public awareness, no-cost support, and education programs online and in person so that people and families affected by mental health conditions can build better lives. We are a lifeline to individuals and families who do not know what to expect in their difficult life journey. We offer classes and support groups and do a lot of local advocacy for mental health. Our programs are free and open to those in our community service areas, but we don't turn anyone away that is in need. Our topic tonight will provide further education to understand treatment-resistant neuropsychiatric illness, including extent, causes, evaluation, and treatment. According to Britannica, neuropsychiatry is used to better understand the neurological underpinnings of psychiatric and neurologic disorders and to examine the treatment and care of persons with neurological conditions, particularly those that affect behavior. In other words, according to top doctors, Neuropsychiatry is focused on, me on mental disorders in patients with damage to the nervous system. This includes neurological diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and cerebral palsy. It also includes mental disorders that develop following brain injuries such as depression, anxiety, cognitive impairments, and more. Tonight's presentation will provide information related to treatment resistance, as well as provide an opportunity to explore two success stories of individuals who sought out treatment for their neuropsychiatric illness. Our speaker has provided us with a pre-recording of a previous presentation to share for tonight's content and will be available at the end of the presentation for a live Q&A. Additionally, you should have received an email from me that includes a handout from Dr. Best for you to refer to during the presentation. Tonight's guest speaker, Dr. Steve Best, provides the highest level of neuropsychiatric and psychiatric care to child and adult patients suffering from complex illnesses, treatment-resistant Ill illnesses, and high core mobility disorders. Dr. Steve Best is board certified in psychiatry and has been the director of the Neuroscience Center in Deerfield, Illinois since 1996. He specializes in brain disorders that affect emotional health, cognitive ability, and everyday behavior. 
His professional interests are treatment resistance for mood, pain, consequences of stroke, dementia. Oh. How's that happening? Sorry, everybody. Um, sorry. He specializes in brain disorders that affect emotional health, cognitive ability, and everyday behavior. His professional interests are treatment resistance for mood pain, consequences of stroke, dementia, concussion, and TBI, or traumatic brain injury, as well as disorders of learning, learning disability, learning differences, and developmental disorders. Dr. Best earned his medical degree at the University of Cincinnati and completed a two-year subspecialty fellowship in neuropsychiatry of children and adults at the Chicago Medical School. During his fellowships, he was trained in the application of functional brain imaging, or PET, to neuropsychiatry by Malcolm Cooper, MD. He provided neuropsychiatric consultations at Ann Kiley Center in North Chicago, Illinois, a state of Illinois facility for the subset of developmentally disabled adults who suffer with severe behavior or psychiatric disorders. In addition, Dr. Bess worked with a large inpatient child and adolescent psychiatric group practice. His intense training and expertise has enabled Dr. Best to provide the highest level of neuropsychiatric, neurological, and psychiatric care to child and adult patients suffering from complex illnesses, treatment resistant illnesses, and high comorbidity disorders. We are honored to share his presentation sent by and led by Dr. Best. We will leave plenty of time for Q&A at the end. If you would like to type your question in the chat box during the conversation, please do. Thank you so much and enjoy. Let me share my screen so you all can see. Thanks for being in here. It's always nice for me to be able to present some of our work. There's a lot of work here. Each of your clipboards has the entire presentation in color, and that might make it easier as I'm trying to point things out. My voice doesn't carry, so if it drops away, somebody's got to warn me. Some of this is self-explanatory. I think that first bullet is the one that's relevant. About half of the people with neuropsychiatric illness don't get better even when they get good diagnostics and good treatment. You add in in the community that somebody's uh, misdiagnosed or be given odd treatment and it gets even worse. These days, people come to us because they've failed to respond to treatment and they're demoralized. As we get into the presentation, you'll see more about this, but there are known risk factors, known comorbidities that create treatment resistance and treatment failure. We used to think of this as a mystery, and the geneticists and math mathematicians went down those roads trying to figure out why is it that some people get better and some don't. It's much more obvious, much more pragmatic than that. As an example, minor head injuries. These are schoolyard injuries that are being discussed in this very important epidemiologic article. So this isn't the person who ended up in a coma or needed intensive care unit treatment. This is a person who might have had a scuffle on the schoolyard, fallen off their skateboard, or something else that really we all like to think of as trivial. Those concussions in the first third of puberty are the difference between being eccentric and developing schizophrenia. There are many varieties of head injury, so we can talk simply about concussion, but when you look at it, the most modern understanding is that there are traumatic brain injuries and non-traumatic brain injuries. That encapsulates what I'm trying to convey today. 
and that there is a science to this. In this assortment, you can see the things that I, I judge to be most important, but all of them are very important when we're dealing with human beings. Just because somebody doesn't fit within an easy category doesn't mean that they can't be understood. And the real reason for me to be here is to not only talk about medical science, but what psychotherapeutic interventions can do. If you look on the right hand side below to wit, you'll see why. Around 50% of the patients in any mental hygiene clinic have personality factors that directly interfere with their ability to respond. We think a personality is simply how a person seems to be, but there's actually a science to that also. So as an example, when the mathematicians struggle to understand what human personality is, it turns out that temperament is inborn varieties of how we learn. Each of us has our own learning style. You've heard about risk takers, harm avoidant behavior, and so on. Well, those are directly related to how brain systems and subsystems relate to one another and what kinds of comorbidities might be expected as those dysfunctions occur. That is not a way for me to dispel responsibility for trying to treat the patient. More to the point, it's how can we understand how to mobilize the appropriate factors in a person and in their life to get around those biological roadblocks, even the ones that seem to be interrelational or personality driven. It's so important that some of the medical schools have come up with their own algorithms, just as physicians look at their own me medical assessment uh, algorithms. Here you've got what people in the behavioral health world can do to modify the suffering of the patient. This is not trivial. There's an interesting article about might be about a decade old at this point for the most rapid interventions for depression. So you've heard of ECT. Now we've all heard about ketamine alone or Spravato in the, uh, in the United States. Well, there are some other ones including exercise and most of all chronotherapies which don't require any equipment other than a light the right kinds of sleep-wake modifications can have a more rapid effect on severe life-threatening depression than medication. That's something that anyone in this room can do. That's something that a, a friend of yours who's a pastor a thousand miles away could do with five minutes of coaching. Here in this kind of Venn-like diagram, we try to encapsulate what we see as important in understanding these treatment-resistant illnesses. How to assess, and what might be done to cause the brain to become able to respond to conventional treatments. While sometimes we need to use rare medicines, more likely it is that we've got to get the brain activated so that it can respond to ordinary and easily available medication. One of the diagnostics that we like is brain spect imaging. There are a bunch of reasons for why that is important in neuropsychiatry as opposed to say cancer treatment and so on. Most of all, it can tell us about blood flow and metabolism and how network functions are being displayed over time. Brain spect can become abnormal a decade before physical anomalies <coughs> are obvious on CT scan, MRI, or even on autopsy. Ah, I forgot one thing here. So we're talking about the colors. This is all specific to each patient. 
but in general, red and white means more highly perfused or more metabolically active, and greens and blues less. Now, it does relate to different regions. There are parts of the brain that are filled with fluid, the spinal fluid, and that shouldn't be active. It's not receiving perfusion. But when looking at the red-white area in the top right corner, that, that entire cortex, which is called the convexity, the outermost layers, those are hyper-perfused, inflamed areas of the brain. We think that that's great, just like when muscles are active, they get pumped up. Well, it's quite the opposite. It's more like a sports car in the rain spinning its tires and wasting a lot of horsepower. This is an example of a patient who literally strolled into our office with the proclamation that we were her last opportunity and that she had considered the different ways to approach suicide. With five months of the treatment that I've devised that activates brain activity instead of subduing it, we brought the brain to looking something like normal in a medical textbook. She stayed in the community, she stayed at home, she did not need to be institutionalized, she didn't need anything beyond medical treatment, including the careful titration of some obnoxious medications that had been prescribed with the best of intent. This is a patient who had been suffering really her entire life. You might notice the gray diagram at the center doesn't look complete, and that's because her frontal lobe activity was very poor. It was almost beyond the ability of the physicist to find it. The tissue was alive, but absolutely dormant. Think about that word. With some treatments, in this case hyperbaric oxygen and the injection, a few injections of a now common medication named Detanercept, her brain went to something like normal. And in a corresponding fashion, her internal emotional state and outward behavior also normalized. Most of all, she was no longer a treatment failure. Psychotherapy finally became effective. She had thought that everything was ineffective and that the way for her to subsist was to be in the basement avoiding stimulus. And she ended up back out in the community living the life that a young person ought to be having. This is a startling kind of transformation. In this patient, his brain became normalized, but it required the addition of that chronotherapy and sleep intervention. In his case, he had the original diagnosis of Tourette's, which occurred in many people in his family across generations with all of the typical neurobehavioral constraints, OCD and so on. He got better, but he did not get fully better. He didn't get the, an adequate level of relief until he started sleeping. And that required regular old CPAP and chronotherapy, something that re requires what we can call coaching. So we're talking about a variety of treatments. There is a unifying concept for all of them.
in each of the, each of these patients, each of these cases, we wakened the brain. Most neuropsychiatric interventions subdue the brain. Medications typically do, almost all of them. ECT does. I'll, I'm not anti-ECT. The right patient, they're going right to ECT, even if I have to have somebody escort them to the hospital. But it does subdue brain activity. That's something for us to consider. Okay. So here's the algorithm as it relates to depression. Now, depression is more encompassing than the DSM diagnosis of major depression. It can include bipolar depression, it can include the depression comorbid to panic disorder or associated with substance use disorder or even post head injury. There's some punch outs where you can drill into things as you look in your handouts at some point if you care to. But going back to <clears throat> the algorithm as it sits naked, what we want to focus on is in green and on the bottom right, and that's enlivening brain circuits. While some of it requires extraordinary neuropsychiatric intervention or even neurosurgical intervention, there's a lot that behavioral therapists can do, with all the way from psychology even to a behavioral analyst approach and that's that chronotherapy. So the lifestyle modifications on the left-hand side of that algorithm from Oregon, one of the center slides that I showed a few moments ago, is relevant to any of us and doesn't require anything beyond the presence of two human beings working on the same problem. I tried to I tried to display that more carefully. That's why we need to be working with colleagues in the behavioral therapy world. I hope it becomes more obvious what neuropsychiatry might be able to do for patients that have failed to respond. Are there any questions? It's typical because people have become so ill and so mistrusting of anything they hear, including from providers, that they need to see it. So as an example with Spectre with EEG, it gives someone true insight. With their eyes, they can see the insides of themselves. That's really important. You know, right now we're treating someone who comes from another country and another culture with a language that's very different. Even the way that she describes her emotional life is very different from what we might understand in North America. But when I explain to her, here's your abnormalities that are creating these kinds of symptoms, and here is the logic path to treat those abnormalities, it destigmatizes and emboldens activity. People don't leave feeling like damaged goods. Quite to the contrary, they now understand what was wrong. As an example, if we do acquire SPECT, the worst two things that people come to the second appointment with are, there's nothing wrong, my brain's normal, or there's something hideous, and the end is near after 35 or 40 minutes that should change to understanding and becoming moralized instead of demoralized so they know what to do. It's one thing for me to assert that cannabis abuse in that particular case is part of their schizophrenic picture. It's another thing when I can show it.
hyperbaric oxygen, like uh, the decompression chambers that Navy divers need to use when they get the bends. So they can be used in a variety of medical applications. Typical on-label ones would be for wound care or carbon monoxide poisoning, sudden loss of vision or hearing. Those are typical. It can also be used off-label in ways that scientists in other countries see as very valid for anything from concussion to rheumatoid conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, autoimmune illnesses like tick-borne illness or other vector-borne conditions. There's some wonderful research right now for its applications in these long COVID or supposedly post-COVID afflictions. Uh, it's 100% oxygen at a pressure on, pressurization. So somebody goes into a machine. In our case, the machines are clear. They're made out of acrylic. And so they can watch TV while they're being pressurized and receive their treatments. The reason that's important is that panic can interfere with the efficacy of the treatment. And distracting them with something like television in this day and age is perfecto. I think we, we simply display what we know. So I can't tell you how many times people tell me that they've heard that hyperbaric oxygen is this, that, and the other bad thing, or TMS is useless. Because some insurance companies to this day like to claim that. I've heard them make similar complaints about ECT. Well, it's best to show a few articles from very mainstream medical journals. In the case of commercially driven negativity, it's best to draw from mathematically well-defined studies. So as an example, for hyperbaric or for transcranial magnetic stimulation, we might bring research data from other places like Israel, Korea, or Scandinavia, which all have socialized medicine. And as a result, the profit incentive turns in the opposite direction to things that require more input by humans and less of the expensive medications. The initial assessment is a conventional psychiatric interview during which I also do a neuropsychiatric ass assessment as we go. Most of a neurologic exam can be done within an interview, not with a reflex hammer. Sometimes insurance covers. We've had insurance cover more than the billed cost of the service. And we've also had insurances send $4 checks. So $4 or $1,800 for the same service that was documented in precisely the same way. Doesn't make any sense and I still don't understand that kind of thing. For that reason, what we do is I think they call it self-pay now. <clears throat> but we do provide the rest of the backup to help people seek their reimbursements. So for, thank you so much, Dr. Best. For uh, any other questions, if you could just kind of speak up a little bit more, um, that'd be awesome, just because we're having this recorded. Um, but I do have a question on behalf of a few of my colleagues. Um, they're very, um, I would say, intrigued as to seeing what your actual place looks like and tour it. Is that, is that uh, you know, is that, do they have an opportunity as clinicians to you know, contact Melanie or whomever and, and tour your facility at some point? Well, we love that, and we have 
our own kitchen with our own cook, so we make our own food. <laughs> because for me, restaurant food is hard at my age. But more to the point, the collegiality extends beyond breaking bread. The best clinical assessments occur when the referral source can participate in the assessment, either by attending the interview or at least being present by Zoom or uh, telephone. I know that seems uh, gimmicky, but it isn't. The assessment of human behavior is much more complex than any of us want to admit to ourselves, but we can all remember the first day that we had to assess a patient on our own and how much tremoring we did within ourselves or maybe even in our hands. It's a team effort. If I just wanted to tour the facility and see the office, should I reach out to Melody? Melanie is the boss. Okay. There are only, <laughs> in, in our facility, which is 30,000 square feet, there are only three possible answers to any question. Okay. Yes, no, or ask Melanie. <laughs> Anything else? Your food's here. <laughs> are there any, like, Yeah, um, we won't give up. So let's say someone, you know, we had a patient who had most of their calvarium, the bone of their skull removed and replaced with a piece of steel. And that person needed our help. Can't use the magnetic stimulator in that case. We found a different way to treat that patient. So instead of assuming that we can't or won't, just ask. A simple email, and we'll say, here's what we know. There's nothing wrong with that. It, it, uh, it's teamwork, once again. That's a perfect case. And of course, their diagnosis was wrong to begin with. You already know that from the way you're casting the question out. You know, when I was in the first year of medical school, my puppy got ill. I didn't know why. I went to the vet who happened to be a classmate. He'd gone to vet school before medical school. He had to uh, change careers because he developed allergies to large animals, and that's what he was working with. He was a great doctor. Uh, there's nothing sarcastic in that. And so Barry was you know, assessing my little puppy dog. And as a veterinarian, his diagnosis for this little puppy dog was depression. Because in veterinary science, depression means that the physiologic constraints of existence have been suppressed. In this case, with the puppy, it was because he ate some rat poison around the corner from the apartment building you know, one of those things, and so he was, uh, you know, he could have died from it. But the first steps of that are low blood pressure, low temperature, and lethargy. Doesn't that sound like depression in humans? Julianne was just saying that she was she had some questions about her dog. Um, <laughs> I'll ask that. Yeah. Well, depression. We, we, we sometimes we think our, our, our pets are, are depressed, you know, and that's kind of what she was saying. So. Um, Got a little fat, a little tired, so. We'll, 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 yeah. Uh, we'll follow up after. Well, all, all joking aside, yeah. uh, you know, it used to be thought that there weren't animal models for these illnesses, whether it was tick disorders, movement disorders, affective illness. It was an enormous struggle within the psychology, the experimental psychology community, that would look like the dispute between the church and the schisming Protestants all those hundreds of years ago 
because it got ugly and mean and dangerous. A lot of people lost careers by asserting that animals have feelings. At this point, they've now, it's now been demonstrated that they have emotional attachments and sentiment. And the physiology of their emotional life is very similar to ours. Um, Dr. Bus, can you tell us a little bit about your golden retriever that walks freely through the um, through your uh, office each day? What? Your dog, your golden retriever that Emmy. greets all of us. Emmy the dog? Yes. So she's my son's dog during the evenings, and she's the therapy dog in the office. We've been through a number of office uh, dogs over the last three decades. Um, she's probably the most soft of all of them, but she's something. There are, re there's, there are reasons for each of those inclusions. It isn't simply to have a dog wandering around. That's good enough, but if you take an autistic or traumatized person, they want nothing to do with any doctors. Even uh, this is how I dress in the clinic. I'm not wearing a white coat or any of that business. They still don't want anything to do with it. But most of the exam can be done by seeing how they respond to the creature. So. Fini? Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much for sharing that video, Dr. Best. I know that our audience is going to have some questions, so we can get that conversation going. Um, first question, and excuse me if I mispronounce some of these words, there's a little bit of jargon that I may not understand, but um, one question says, Doctor, you spoke about cr uh, chronotherapy and CPAP to help regulate sleep. What is chronotherapy? We call that sleep therapy or wake therapy. So people with depression are in a dormant state. And what we want to do is activate brain activity. We will actually help people to sleep less. And the contrapositive for manic-like illness is we would seek the the opposite, where we would help a person to rest or perhaps even to sleep. That helps to entrain the brain's activity to the normal activity cycle for mammals, which is during the day. Thank you very much. Um, next question says, doctor, you mentioned ketamine. I thought this was controversial. Is this effective and for what diagnosis? Are there side effects and is it widely used? Ketamine is controversial for a number of reasons. It is available as a fully licensed treatment for suicidality or depression uh, through the, uh, the brand name and the labeling of a chemical or product named Spravato. Uh, I'm not sure how strong of an antidepressant ketamine or its isomers is, but it is wonderful for dysphoria, suicidality, and so on. And it can have beneficial effects in lessening suffering. Any medicine can have side effects when prescribed and the patient is carefully attended to. We haven't seen side effects. On the other hand, it can be a drug of abuse and so it needs to be treated with quite a lot of respect. It's widely used uh, across the world. It's been around for almost 60 years, was initially applied in Vietnam, and it was rapidly noticed to have psychiatric and uh, psychological effects in addition to its intended purpose at that time, which was for anesthesia and pain control. Thank you so much. Next question says, how do I know when to take my adult child to a neuropsychiatric um, as opposed to just a regular psychiatrist? 
I think when there are treatment failures that a person should uh, go further. Now, <clears throat> neuropsychiatry is <clears throat> part of psychiatric training. Unfortunately, it's been discouraged as a part of everyday professional practice. As all of you know, psychiatry has become more of a team leader and prescriber activity versus going beyond and becoming the subspecialist for care. But as I said, for those 50% of psychiatric patients who fail to get adequate relief, they should consider going further and see someone who has an interest in neuropsychiatric approaches. Thank you. Uh, let's see, next question. Is bipolar illness always congenital brain formation in utero, excuse me, or can it develop as a result of mild head trauma or illness in childhood? I think the easiest way to look at this is from a big word, which means a lot, diathesis. So people can have tendencies that are built in, larger or smaller tendencies. You know, uh, as I mentioned in that presentation, there was a family that was uh, heavily loaded with Tourette syndrome suffering. But the reality is that things can make conditions come to the fore sooner or later, more intensively or less. We know that early interventions are helpful for most of the severe mental disorders. That includes bipolar disorder lessening other traumas to the brain in addition to whatever might be, so to speak, built in, can only be good. So fewer head traumas, fewer substance use exposures, less childhood adversity, all of that has its place. Thank you. Uh, next question says, if a client has been on medications for 30 years, um, Oh, excuse me, has tardive, oh, help me with this one. Dis TD. <laughs> yeah. call, it, call it TD. TD, thank you. And other side effects, have you seen a lessening uh, symptoms with different types of intervention? Yes, those conditions should be treatable in most cases. Thank you. Next person is asking if you can speak about ECT long-term treatments a bit more. Sure. Uh, in many parts of the world, ECT is the most sophisticated level of treatment available. There are a hundred years worth of research at this point about ECT, its potency, its efficacy, and its safety. Like any medical intervention, it can be good or not. There are ways to mitigate the, uh, the need for long-term ECT, but there are many patients, it's the right thing for them. It can save their lives and Im improve the quality of their everyday living, even if there are sometimes side effects. Side effects might be minimal or quite troubling in the cognitive realm. There's also the hassle of going into the hospital every week or two or three for a maintenance care. Nevertheless, it's something that should be in every hospital's armamentarium. Thank you. Um, next question says, can you diagnose bipolar disorder that has not yet emerged with EEGs or other scans? Uh, no. So when we talk about this condition, if we have to be careful about assuming that the words mean something they don't. When we diagnose bipolar disorder, that means a person is having clinical symptoms that should be easily observable to any interested party. This isn't somebody who is secretly having moods inside of themselves and perhaps their uh, intimates remain oblivious. These are people who are having 
disturbances on the outside of themselves and how they relate with others, how they relate to the world itself and its stressors. So it's not bipolar disorder if it hasn't yet emerged clinically. It may be that diathesis or tendency, but it wouldn't be the illness itself. Thank you. How does one schedule an appointment at your office? Can you shoot an email up to the front desk, schedule at neuroscience.md. We'll take care of it. Thank you. And you mentioned Melanie. I, I was able to have the privilege of speaking with her, but you mentioned her in the video and I'm sure the audience does not know who that is. So would you mind um, shedding some light on who Melanie is? Sure. Melanie is a patient care coordinator and liaison. She's a, a, a senior therapist. And in addition, she acts as an interpreter to help people understand what's going on in our um, dizzying clinic. She's great. Um, yeah. Okay, next question. Um, you mentioned that concussions in the first third of puberty can lead to psychiatric conditions. What ages are you speaking about here? So puberty is in that age range of something like 12 to 20. In the first third is when a significant amount of brain development is occurring. Uh, I want to be careful that concussions and, and other head injuries, more severe ones, can affect anyone at any age. What I was trying to point out simply is that one of the biggest differences between the quirky person down the street and the person who is suffering with a diagnosable mental disorder like schizophrenia are those concussions and other minor or so-called trivial insults to the brain in that first third of puberty. So even a 30 year old can have a concussion and develop a very troubling mental illness. But by definition, because that condition set in later in life, instead of in the developmental years, we think of it differently. That's an adult onset illness. It still needs to be treated, but we should have a different kind of scrutiny for that illness. Good question. Um, I have a couple people who have their hand raised. I've honestly never used this chat before, but let's try it. Pat, Pat Roberto, I see that your hand is raised. I'm clicking allow to talk. She just popped right in there. Pat, did you have a question? I don't know how to get her off now. <laughs> no, she'll listen. She knows how to find me. <laughs> uh, okay, next question. And Pat, you're just going to stay up here because I don't know how to, how to move you back to your other room. Um, next question. What is the relationship between nutrition and severe psychiatric illness? How does one get information or consultation on nutrition issues? Ah, this is a great one. So the directions, the connection is bi-directional. Uh, the gastrointestinal and digestive health are related to neurological conditions, including severe psychiatric illness. Nutrition has its own inputs. People who have inherited glitches in how they process chemicals have another additional set of metabolic suffering. The way to be assessed is to see someone who is interested in such conditions. We use lab tests to help guide us, and we have specialists on our staff that help us to understand both the nature of the disturbance and what to do. I want to point something out, that whenever someone is ill or under stress, that their digestive tract will suffer almost instantaneously. One of the first things that's done in the emergency room when somebody has a stroke is that they get an injection of uh, 
medicine that blocks the production of stomach acid, and that's because of the association of stroke and ulcer disease. That's how rapidly the two organ systems can talk to one another and affect each other. Next person said, please talk about heavy use of marijuana in the late teen years and its effect on the brain and mental illness. Well, I think it's easiest to consider that to be another insult or uh, concussion-like injury. That's a non-traumatic injury versus concussion, which is traumatic brain injury of sorts. Anything that affects the brain in those developmental years is going to have a negative input. The brain isn't fully grown. Human behavior and personality aren't fully defined by those ages. And so the, you can get very severe, very major consequences for something that uh, a more adult person might shake off. Thank you. Um, next question. Uh, would you mind providing the email or contact information for your office one more time? I will send it in the chat for everybody to see. Uh, yeah, let me just, I'm going to type it in that. Awesome. Thank you. I can do that while we're talking about the next one. Awesome. Okay, next question. Are there neuropsychiatric treaters in California? How can we find like-minded physicians if we are out of state? Have you worked with people with eating disorders? So two separate questions. So yes, you can. It's not difficult to find neuropsychiatrists. As I said, their neuropsychiatric training should be part of any psychiatric training program. And it probably was, that doesn't mean that people still apply that knowledge, but I think the easiest way to look is to query someone, to simply ask, are they comfortable in looking at these illnesses? If they say so, then it's likely that they're going to have an open mind and be able to look into it. Thank you. Next one says, does your center take over medication management or continue to confer with existing uh, psych psychiatrists? Psychiatrists, excuse me. We're willing to take over parts of the care or all of the care. Uh, sometimes people are sent by their own psychiatrist or, or neurologist or even a, a fellow neuropsychiatrist and then we'll do some of the things that are that distinguish us from other facilities and at other times people want to transfer their care to us whatever serves the patient is what we'll try to do good to know um next question and guys i'm gonna mess up this word again i'm so sorry and can you become dependent on Zeprexa? Did I get it right? Yes, you got it. <laughs> nice. Can you become dependent on Zeprexa or does it change your brain in a negative way? Any medicine can have positive and negative consequences. I don't know if Zeprexa actually changes the brain per se, but it does change the function of the brain. As I said, like most psychiatric medications, it will subdue brain activity that can be very helpful at the right time in the right situation. At other times, it can be way too much and interfere. I've never seen someone become dependent in that it isn't an addictive drug because it doesn't give a sense of euphoria. But I'm sure that a person could become habituated and feel a need for it. Thank you. Next question says, how does the dog in your office help with assessing autistic or other patients? What do you see and look for? 
Well, I think there are the obvious uh, features. How does a person use their body, but also how do they relate? So I, I remember a patient with a, a sensory integration disorder, and he didn't understand that he was literally rubbing the therapy dog the wrong way and roughing her fur up, which made the dog uncomfortable. So there are a number of ways, but in general, getting somebody at ease is the way to get a more clear sense of who they are and how we can be helpful. Someone who comes in the office and they're uh, pins and needles, we're not gonna be able to get uh, move seamlessly towards diagnosis and, and intervention plan. Thank you. Sounds like a fun office. <laughs> Next one says, I just want to get clear. Is it true that for someone with a neuro site, I always, Sorry, is it true that for someone with a neuropsychiatric problem that good old fashioned therapy is still useful or is not needed? I'm just confused right now. I had hoped that that slide from Oregon would make it transparent about just how important it is for a person to have access to the services that we think of as psychotherapy. It's very important. Uh, we aren't machines and we need to be treated as humans and given that level of leeway and grace. Okay, next says, how does a typical patient or family know if they are taking too much of a medication? Well, I, I think it, one of the easiest ways is the one that's neglected, which is to try to zero in on the dosing of a medicine. So let, let's just say it's lithium because that, that's the one that comes from the ground. Okay, Nobody created it, they just purified it. An easy way to find out if they're on the right dose is to gradually move the dose up and down over time as a person settles down they'll be able to discern what is best for them. The only way you're gonna get that is if they become well. I don't think you can really do that with someone who is so ill that they've lost insight and judgment. But once they become really able to give informed consent and can participate in their own care, I don't see why it would be difficult to discern the dosage. Good question. Um, next question. Do you treat people with migraines? Yes, especially uh, because those conditions are so common in people with other neuropsychiatric afflictions. Thank you. Um, next, we are getting back to the dog. What conclusions do you derive from the patient that does not want to engage with the dog and does not pay attention to it? I don't, I don't know if I draw a conclusion. Sometimes it's obvious a person, you know, was scared of dogs and so on, or they might be allergic or culturally, they, there are certain cultures that see dogs as dirty and they don't want them inside the building or near them at all. Of course, we respect all of those positions. There's no reason to be judgmental and pretend that I know what's going on in somebody else. I was thinking something similar. What if the patient was allergic? Yeah. Um, same idea. Um, next person. Oh, this one said the chat is disabled. Thank you for letting me know that. Um, yes, I will email the information um, that Dr. Bus put in the chat. I will send a follow-up email to everybody tomorrow and I will provide um, that contact information for you in case you did not get a chance to write it down now. Um, okay. Next question, what can a SPECT show that justifies administering the test? I think the justification is when there are cases of, of treatment failure or when a person 
hasn't been able to get a sense of what's wrong. And it would be helpful for them to have that physical sense to the ability to see the inner workings of their nervous system. Remember that epilepsy was thought to be some kind of spiritual affliction and that it was only when EEG was devised and perfected that people started to re realize that it, the brain was ill and that there was a way that ought to treat the illness. So spec, I don't, I don't know about using spec pell-mell. It is expensive. It's quite a bit of hassle. Not everyone wants to uh, subject themselves to that kind of review. But when somebody is having treatment failure, they ought to know that there are other tools at their disposal if they choose to involve themselves. Is it a long process? Is that an assessment? Can you um, explain what SPECT is a little bit more? So SPECT is one kind of functional brain imaging. It's similar to PET imaging, which I think is more common and most people have heard of because it's used so often for cancer or dementia workups. Uh, we uh, have a chemical that we inject and a few minutes later, we take a half hour worth of pictures of the brain. After the physicists and the engineers are done, then we'll end up with beautiful pictures like the ones that I had in my slideshow. And th those can really uh, take the guesswork out of assessing physiology and can help us understand not only what to try, but what to avoid. Thank you. Um, next question says, how long do you need to take <clears throat> Zeprexa after a psychotic episode? And when is it safe to tap her and stop taking it? What does recovery from this uh, psychotic episode look like? After a single episode of severe mental illness, we think of people having six to 12 months of medication, whether it's depression, manic depression, schizophrenia, a psychotic episode per se. After that, a person might want to see about tapering the dose and they might want to see about being becoming medication free. Those are serious decisions that shouldn't be made by any one person all on their own just as these conditions affect the person and the people around them. I think that the patient can benefit from getting input from others. It might be a treater, it might be their neighbor that they trust, but it's not something to uh, be cookbook about, which don't wanna just come up with an instruction that everyone should do this, that, or the other. It's personalized. Good question. Um, next question. How can I get my daughter to want to get help? She says no one or nothing can help. Again, that, that's why it's so important for people to be able to have the opportunity for therapeutic interactions. We can be therapeutic for others, even, you know, just at a bus stop. <clears throat> Sometimes there requires professional intervention. I don't know what your daughter's uh, health care has been like. It might be time for her to try a different approach, something that can give her insight. Sorry to hear that. Um, back to SPECT. Can SPECT be helpful in mood disorders or OCD? Yes, it can be helpful in any of these so-called psychiatric disorders, and especially when there's been treatment failure or so-called treatment resistance. Can you speak about oh, vagal? vagal? Yes, I got it right. Nerve stimulation for treatment-resistant depression. It has an important place. It's another form of neurosurgical uh, treatment for mental illness. It was uh, applied in the United States first for the epilepsies and then soon thereafter 
was applied in the affective disturbances like depression and has an important place to even to this day. It's useful. Reading this next question made me laugh a little bit because I was I was thinking the same thing and I was wondering if you ever took images of your brain because it's there. Um, but this person says, I'm so interested in brain functioning and would love to get a look at my brain with one of those scans, but I don't have treatment resistant depression. Would it be possible to get the scans anyway somehow? Guessing it would not be covered by insurance. I'm just curious. It's a great question. <laughs> Uh, there are people who come in and, and simply want to see, they may have seen a presentation on, on public TV and they're very curious. There's nothing wrong with that. Still, it's an expense and, and uh, there's a, a very mild amount of radioactivity involved in taking the picture, similar to getting uh, an arm x-rayed. So it should be taken uh, seriously. It's not a, a party joke. Next question, can someone with bipolar ever be lithium free? Yes. The bigger issue is balancing risk and benefits. So there are benefits to being off medicine, but there are also some scary outcomes that can occur. Each case needs to be thought of in a very individualized way. Is improper nutrition typically identified and tracked through interviews alone or also by specific colors on a brain scan? Oh, the assessments I was talking about are uh, things like blood tests. Next question. Do you have most of these treatment options in your office? How much CBT and talk therapy accompany your treatment protocol? Good question. Most of the options are here in the office. Uh, behavioral therapy, psychotherapy, and counseling are part of almost every single case that we've ever treated. Uh, most often it would be outside therapists who are participating. We don't, uh, we do have some therapists on staff, but it's a neuropsychiatric facility, not a, a psychotherapy practice. And so in general, we refer to our colleagues across the country when psychotherapies are needed. Great question. Um, next, what is the best treatment for OCD and severe anxiety? And can this cause psychosis? Uh, the best treatment would be individualized. It's common that psychosis can be part of OCD and the comorbidity of OCD with manic depressive illness is enormous. So we expect to see mood suffering at the same time that there is OCD behavior in most cases. This one is not a question, but it is a comment that I do think is worth sharing. It says, Dr. Best, Thank you for your balanced scientific approach and the gift of your time today. You have opened up the door of hope that I thought did not exist. And thank you for your efforts in collaborating with providers. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Next question. If a patient is on Medicaid, could they get your services? We don't accept insurance, but plenty of people on Medicaid, for whatever reason, will decide that they're going to fund their behavioral health and psychiatric care on their own. I've seen churches and other religious institutions do the same. So we don't forbid people who are on public aid or Medicare or commercial insurance, but we don't accept them. I, we don't have a fiduciary relationship with those insurers and payers. Thank you. If a person was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, but has been off lithium and functioning well for a long time with other medication and therapy, might there have been a misdiagnosis originally? That's possible. We need to keep an open mind. Good question. 
Okay. Any other questions from our audience members? I think you answered them all, Dr. Best. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, great. Yeah, this has been yeah. wonderful. We we really appreciate your time. And uh, to our to our audience, if you did uh, enjoy tonight's program, um, we have a ton of programs on our website at www.namiccns.org. Please check it out. Um, our next program is going to be held on November 8th, a Wednesday from 7 o'clock to 8.30, where we will have Dr. Blodgett provide information on neuropsychology. So we'll get a little bit of a different um, insights. She's Once great. You'll love her. Oh, you know her? I didn't yeah. know that. Very cool. All right. That's wonderful. Um, once you all log off, there is going to be a short survey at the end um, of this uh, meeting. Please, please, please take a minute to fill it out. It's not very long. Um, this information will not only provide us feedback from tonight's uh, presentation and program, but it will also give us data that we need to write grants and raise money to continue to provide our programs for free. So please take it. It will only take you two minutes, I promise. Um, and we would really appreciate that. Um, and we uh, thank you again, Dr. Buss, for everything. We really appreciate you coming here. Um, and we hope to see you at another event sometime soon. That'd be great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Bye. Bye.